The following is an audio transcript of the book, Justification Before God, Not by Faith. This is tape number two, side A. We were in chapter four. Divine law differs from human law. Consequently, Christians should beware of the plausible and distinguish things that differ. Human analogies do not always illustrate biblical principles. They often lead astray. For example, a man may be forgiven of his crime by the person against whom the crime was committed. However, the criminal is not cleared in the eyes of the law. On the other hand, a criminal may be convicted of his crime and imprisoned. He pays his debt to society, but that does not indicate that he has been forgiven by the person against whom the crime was committed. The sinner differs in that he is guilty, and Jesus Christ died in his place. Sin is antagonistic against the very nature of God. Individuals must answer to him for every sin committed. Sinners are lawbreakers. Sin must be punished because it is sin, and justice must punish sin because it is justice. Since sin is on the sinner, justice must punish both sin and the sinner. However, if sin is imputed to Jesus Christ, justice must strike through sin and the person bearing it. Once justice strikes, it exhausts itself and can never strike again. The Lord Jesus Christ is the infinite sacrifice for the persons and sin of God's elect. Punishment for God's chosen ones exhausted itself on Christ. Therefore, the elect are set free. The righteous character of God is declared in God's satisfaction in His Son. Therefore, the holy God can declare an unjust person just and remain just in the declaration. Faith does not make the law void. Romans chapter 3 verses 30 and 31. A finished painting does not destroy the artist's version, but verifies it. And a completed building does not disannul its plans, but substantiates them. The Lord Jesus Christ did not destroy the Lamb. He was the Lamb. The law was established by the execution of its penalty, not by relieving the lawbreaker. The penalty must be paid by either Jesus Christ or the lawbreaker himself. The satisfaction of God's divine nature was necessary that he might look favorably upon sinful mankind. That which satisfies God involves his holy character. His holiness prohibits his looking in mercy on the ungodly. His holy law must be satisfied before his mercy and love can operate to declare the ungodly just before that law. The Lord Jesus Christ died to satisfy divine justice. Satisfaction is not a biblical word used with reference to Christ's death, but the truth intended by that word is everywhere ascribed to the death of Jesus Christ. Satisfaction is a word borrowed from the law, and it refers to full compensation of the creditor from the debtor. The debtor is man, and the debt is sin. Death is required to make satisfaction for that debt. The obligation by which the debtor is bound is the holy law of God. God, the creditor, requires satisfaction from sinful man because he is the offended person. The ransom paid by Jesus Christ has come between the holy God and unholy man. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 Divine satisfaction must precede personal peace with God. The debtor's peace is the natural consequence of knowing the creditor is satisfied. The only way to have peace below is to know that the sin question has been settled above. Christ's redemptive work balanced the books of God, restored moral equilibrium, and paid back to God all that of which sin robbed him. Christ's deity gave him the capacity to minister to the divine nature. And his humanity enabled him to offer himself as the substitute for his chosen ones. United divine and human natures constituted the divine person, the God-man. But natures are revealed in his, quote, being put to death in the flesh, 
but quickened by the Spirit. Close quote. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. He was put to death in the flesh because God absolutely considered cannot die. Jesus Christ alone could say, quote, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Close quotes. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Chapter 5 The Seat of Saving Faith The seat of saving faith is the heart of the regenerated person. Justification of the elect in the presence of God is the foundation for justification by faith. Faith is not substituted for or accepted in the place of righteousness before God. Faith and righteousness must be distinguished. Faith is the act of the person who has been made righteous in the righteousness of Christ. It is the fruit of imparted righteousness. Righteousness is what Christ purchased for the elect. Romans chapter 5 verses 17 through 19. Identifying faith with righteousness makes many passages of scripture unintelligible. Righteousness is connected with faith. But to identify it as faith destroys the various meanings of some Greek prepositions used in connection with faith. Quote, by faith, close quote. Ek pisteos. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Through faith. Ek pisteos. Romans chapter 3, verse 30. By faith. Dia pisteos. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. And by faith. Dia Pasteos, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. On the other hand, faith is through the righteousness of God. 1. Faith is brought about by the impartation of righteousness. 2. Faith is the means of embracing and understanding. 3. Faith and its fruits are imperfect, but the righteousness of God is perfect. A person is declared righteous before God, not on the basis of his imperfect faith, but on the foundation of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. 4. Faith, while directed to the righteousness of Christ, is not the righteousness of Christ. 5. Faith is a righteous act, but it is not a perfect act. One can never be declared righteous before God by an imperfect act. Paul spoke of the faith of God's elect in Titus chapter 1 verse 1. But he also said that all men have not faith, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 2. Those who have the faith of God's elect are those who were ordained to eternal life, Acts chapter 13 verse 48. Those who were thus ordained to eternal life are shut up to the faith that shall be revealed, Galatians chapter 3 verse 23. God, who has disclosed himself objectively in history, in his Son, and in his written word, will enlighten the elect subjectively, in order that we may apprehend his self-disclosure experientially. Everyone who has been given faith in regeneration is shut up to the faith that is revealed, Jesus Christ himself. Much of that which is called faith is nothing more than an advantageous quality of the soul without any respect to the reality or unreality of its professed object. Having been declared righteous by the sovereign God, justifying righteousness is revealed through faith. This is the fruit of regeneration, and the results are now unfolded. The justifying act of God is followed in time by an appropriating act of faith on the part of the one who has been justified before divine justice. Justifying faith before the human consciousness is not passive, but active. The individual participates in the act. It is manifested first by coming to Christ. Every person the Father gave to the Son will come to him, and not one will be lost. John chapter 6, verse 37. It is believing on Christ, Acts chapter 16, verse 31. It is committing oneself to Christ. 
Faith and justification differ in nature. Righteousness is the ground of acceptance before God, and faith is simply the instrument of embracing and resting in the righteousness of God. Since justification is a sentence that passed in the mind of God from eternity and passed on Jesus Christ in the covenant, faith is not first. It is not the efficient cause because God, and not faith, justifies. The moving cause is the free grace of God. The substance of justice is Jesus Christ. The relation of faith to justifying righteousness in no way indicates that faith itself is that righteousness. Faith is the experience of the individual appropriating what the Father has declared. The Father's declaration, not the believer's faith, gives the believer assurance. Regeneration is inseparable from its effects, one of which is faith. Without regeneration, none can savingly believe in Jesus Christ. Moreover, the regenerated cannot do other than believe in Jesus Christ because the objective message flows through the subject of faith that was given him in regeneration, and he experiences conversion. Regeneration is the act of God. Subjective faith is the act of the regenerated person in the power of the Holy Spirit. The good ground hearer in the parable of the sower illustrates subjective faith. He heard the word, understood, Matthew 13:23, received, Mark chapter 4, verse 20, and kept it, Luke chapter 8, verse 15. That is the biblical definition of subjective faith the principle of faith which God gives in regeneration. One cannot believe he is justified until he has been justified. He cannot reason himself into justification. That is the reason objective faith must flow through subjective faith. The testimony of objective truth to the finished work of Jesus Christ gives basis to one's confidence and assurance. Chapter 5, Subheading Faith out of the ability to hear. God-given faith does not come through hearing God's word. Faith is the fruit of regeneration. The general consensus of opinion about the teaching of Romans chapter 10 verse 17 is that faith comes by hearing the word of God. The following arguments from John chapter 3 verse 18 have been given to substantiate that opinion. 1. This verse says that without faith one is condemned. 2. How can one be spiritually alive and condemned at the same time? 3. By what means does one become a son of God? Galatians chapter 3 verse 26. 4. Does not faith in conjunction with the Holy Spirit bring a sinner from darkness to light? 5. Is not a sinner required to hear the gospel, be quickened unto life by the Holy Spirit, Repent and believe the gospel of Christ in order for him to be a living, regenerated son of God. 6. Is not anyone less than this a mutated being who is spiritually alive, but who is yet condemned and not a son of God? 7. What shall the time-lapse people do with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13? Note how one event flows biblically into the other without lapse or hesitation. They trusted after they heard the gospel. Upon hearing the gospel, they believed. After they believed, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In contrast to these seven arguments, a person must first be quickened by God before he has faith. The only way Romans chapter 10 verse 17 can be understood is to look at it in the light of its context. Chapters 9 through 11 concern Israel. Paul dealt with the absolute sovereignty of God in salvation, chapter 9, verses 1 through 29. He then discussed righteousness out of Christ versus righteousness out of the law, chapter 9, verses 30 through chapter 10, verse 8. Next, he declared that imparted righteousness is revealed in conversion, chapter 10, verses 9 through 21. In his discussion of righteousness out of Christ, in contrast to righteousness out of the law, Paul showed that through self-effort, Israel had not attained righteousness out of the law. They sought righteousness by works rather than out of the faithful one. Paul quoted Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, 
to show the reason for some believing and others not believing. Quote, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Close quote. The Lord Jesus is the massive living rock. He became a stone of stumbling over whom the self-righteous Pharisees stumbled. They had a zeal for God, but their zeal was not according to knowledge. They went about to establish their own righteousness out of the law, and they would not be submissive to the righteousness out of the faithful one, Jesus Christ, who is the goal of righteousness to all believing. The Jews, like all others, or without excuse. God's not choosing an individual does not leave that person without excuse. Every person is a reasonable being. God is not the author of one's depravity. Man is the author of his own depravity. Many, like the Jews, are guilty of seeking righteousness out of the law. Institutions are filled with self-righteous people who are seeking spiritually on a human level. They profess to be Christians, but they deny that Jesus Christ is impeccable and say that he could be tempted. The religious world talks about the baby Jesus. They deal with everything on a human level. Hence, their salvation is humanistic. Christ did not lay aside his attributes when he assumed a human nature. He went as far as he could to meet you and me to become our mediator but he lifts us out of the humanistic concept. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Paul could identify with the religious Jews because he had been one among them. Therefore, he expressed the desire of his heart and his prayer on behalf of them for their salvation. He was not discussing regeneration. He desired to have a part in the salvation of the remnant of the present time. Romans chapter 11, verse 5. Thus, he was not praying contrary to the will of God. God will not answer a prayer unless it is according to his will. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. God had promised that the nation of Israel would be saved, but that was beyond Paul's time. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. That does not mean all the Jews. Many of them are dead and many of them are dying. But God promised to save a certain number, and he discussed that number in Revelation 7. It can be said that Paul's desire and prayer was for the elect Jews. God does not promise to save anyone because someone prays for him. A man once said he had been praying for an individual for a long period of time, and finally the Lord regenerated that person in answer to his prayer. An instructed Christian told him that his faith should be strengthened from that experience so that he would pray for the whole world. Moreover, he would be selfish to limit his prayer to one person. The instructed Christian was showing him that God regenerates no one because we pray for him. Nevertheless, we do pray that if it is God's will, that he will grant that we might have part in the salvation of his elect by presenting the gospel to them when the Holy Spirit has quickened them. That is praying in the will of God. God's sovereignty is no barrier to prayer. It does not limit our concern. Paul had concern for those whom God had promised to save. The religious Jews were forsaking the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. They were so enamored with their own doings and were so zealous for their humanistic ideals that they left the righteousness of God and were going about establishing their own form of righteousness. They would not subject themselves to the righteousness that is out of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, who has become the goal of righteousness to all believing ones. The Jews had a zeal for God, but it was not according to knowledge. They were ignorant of the righteousness of God, Jesus Christ. They crucified Jesus Christ because of their ignorance of his person and work. Their ignorance led them to try to establish their own righteousness, and they would not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Religious institutions are filled with the same kind of people. Jesus Christ has been made unto the elect the righteousness of God, 
Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He is the end of the ceremonial law. All the shadows pointed to the substance, Jesus Christ. He is also the end of the judicial aspect of the law. He suffered the penalty of the law. Therefore, the Christian has Jesus Christ, who was made unto him righteousness. Christ is the object of his God-given faith. Righteousness out of the law speaks terror. Offense in one point makes one guilty of breaking the whole law. James chapter 2, verse 10. Every time one looks at the law, he sees that he has come short of keeping it. Jesus Christ alone has kept it to the letter. No one can keep it because his flesh is weak. Romans chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. Righteousness out of the law shows that the offender will be judged. Quote, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Close quotes. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul was amplifying the latter part of Romans 9 when he said, The man practicing the righteousness out of the law will live in its fear. Romans chapter 10, verse 5. That man is a legalist. Righteousness out of the law is in contrast to righteousness out of faith. Verse 6. Righteousness out of the law and righteousness out of the finished work of Christ are opposite. But there is no difference between righteousness out of the law and righteousness out of man's faith, or righteousness out of baptism. One is justified before God by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which has been imputed to his account. This is not faith righteousness, but righteousness out of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Since Christ is the object of faith, the regenerating spirit directs the quickened person to Jesus Christ. Christ vicariously fulfilled all the requirements of the law for the elect by both precept and penalty. In contrast with the righteousness of the law that brings terror, the righteousness out of the faithfulness of Christ gives peace and forbids us to fear damnation. Paul declared that imparted righteousness is revealed in conversion. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 21. Conversion enables the regenerated person to confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in his heart that God has raised him from the dead, and be saved. Since conversion and not regeneration is under discussion here, subjunctive mood verbs are used in verse 9. For confessing the Lord Jesus with the mouth and believing in the heart that God has raised him from the dead, a third class condition particle, eon, is used with the subjunctive mood verbs. Quote, confess, close quote. An arius act is subjunctive of amalageo, which means may confess. And, quote, believe, close quote. An arius act is subjunctive of pastuo, which means may believe. To denote that man has a part in his conversion, but not in his regeneration. Man's confessing and believing is made possible because righteousness has already been imputed to him and imparted in him. Quote, For with the heart, cardia, man believeth unto, ice, the ablative of cause, which means because of, righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto, ice, ablative of cause, which means because of, salvation. Close quote. Verse 10. With the heart, one believes because of righteousness, and with the mouth, he confesses because of his salvation. The same thing is true with reference to baptism. One is baptized because he has repented. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. John the Baptist baptized people because they had repented. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. When the apostle spoke of believing with the heart, he was not talking about the organ that pumps blood but about the seat of the inner man, the seat of the Holy Spirit. The seat of the inner man is in contrast with what the man says. There is no value in confessing someone unknown to oneself. 
Confession and faith are both Christian acts. A sinner cannot believe in Jesus Christ, and he cannot produce a Christian life. Hence, the subject of faith, righteousness, is not here. If faith itself is the righteousness, how could it be called the righteousness of God? Is a person justified before God by his faith? Christ is made unto us righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. God has made Christ, quote, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, close quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul was talking about heart faith and not mental assent when he spoke of believing with the heart. The regenerated heart, in contrast to the mouth, is the seat of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, heart faith is more than mental assent. It includes heart and mouth, faith and confession, and righteousness and salvation. Most church members assume that winning the lost and winning souls are synonymous terms. When they talk about winning the lost, they refer to bringing them to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. No one can lead a lost person from darkness to light, but he who wins souls is wise. A soul is won by giving an already regenerated person the truth by which he can be converted, by leading him out of error into truth. Salvation, from man's perspective, is that he confesses because he is saved. He is saved because he has called on the Lord. He calls on the Lord because he has believed. He believes because he has heard. He has heard because a preacher preached the gospel to him. The preacher preached because he was sent by God. From God's perspective, the reverse is true. God sends the preacher. The preacher preaches. The person who has been given a hearing ear hears. Having heard, he believes. Having believed, he calls on the Lord. Calling on the Lord, he is saved. And he confesses, he is saved. When studied as a unit, Romans chapter 10, verses 12 through 17, will show that hearing the word results from one having been given the ability to hear. Christ must be revealed through the gospel before one can experience faith. The ability to hear produces faith. Paul drew from Isaiah's experience in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, to show that the reason all have not obeyed the gospel is because they did not believe his preaching. Romans chapter 10, verse 16. They did not have ears capable of hearing because the Holy Spirit had not circumcised, quickened their ears to hear. Hearing a message does not produce faith. It takes the regenerating Spirit of God to quicken a person. It takes life to produce the ability to hear. Faith does not produce life, but life produces faith. The Greek noun, akoe, can mean either the ability to hear or the message heard. Context alone will determine its meaning. In verse 16, the word, quote, report, close quote, is akoe, which can be translated preaching. Who believed our preaching? In verse 17, Akae is used two times. One, consequently, faith is by means of ek, ablative of means, the ability to hear, Akaes, ablative feminine singular of Akae. And two, the message heard, Akae, nominative feminine singular, is by means of dia, ablative of means, a declaration, hermatus, ablative neuter singular of herma, a word, saying, declaration, or speech, concerning Christ. When one takes the time to study the noun, akae, in Mark chapter 7, verse 35, John chapter 12, verse 38, Acts chapter 17, verse 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 17, Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 5, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, and 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. He will have no difficulty understanding Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Where does faith come from? Does it come from hearing the message preached, or does it come from the ability to hear? Faith comes from the ability to hear. It has no reference to the message heard. Consequently, 
faith comes from the ability to hear, and this ability to hear comes from regeneration. If one does not have the ability to hear, how can he have faith? The message heard is by means of a declaration concerning Christ, who is the righteousness of God. Faith is called into exercise because of the ability to hear. The ability to believe is because of the ability to hear. Therefore, faith is called into exercise by means of the ability to hear, and the message heard is by means of a message concerning Christ. Preaching alone will not produce faith. Faith does not point to itself. Faith, which is the gift of God, is the fruit of regeneration. Faith, which comes from the ability to hear, points us to Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. That which points us to righteousness cannot be the righteousness. Hence, faith is the fruit of imparted righteousness. Righteousness does not consist of either confession or faith. The righteousness which Paul set in contrast to the righteousness out of the law that brought terror to him brought conviction and conversion experience to him. The righteousness of Christ gives peace. Righteousness is Christ by performance. He lived a righteous life and died on the cross paying the penalty that righteousness demands. Righteousness is the Father's by donation. It is ours through impartation by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit imparted that righteousness to us because it had already been legally imputed to our account before God. Hearing is necessary to believing. But this hearing is more than having the organ of hearing. There are ears to hear, but they do not hear. There are eyes to see, but they do not see. God is the author of both the seeing eye and the hearing ear. Although Israel had heard the message, they did not understand. Verse 19. Israel's disobedience was punished by God's turning to the Gentiles. Isaiah said God was found by the ones who sought him not. No one seeks God until he has been quickened. No one tries to find the Lord until the Lord first finds him. Chapter 5, Second Division The Message of Reconciliation The message of reconciliation has been entrusted to God's people. The necessity of its proclamation in order that the elected, regenerated person might know he has been justified was emphasized in Paul's message to the Corinthian Christians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 17. Continually having the fear of the Lord, Paul said, quote, We persuade, present active indicative of patho, which means persuade, appeal to, or convince men, close quote. He did not coerce or compel by force. Persuasion and coercion differ. Coercion is without any regard for a person's desire. Persuasion is by teaching and appealing from the scriptures, giving the exhortations God has given us to give. No one should be intimidated to do something for which he has no desire. Paul was continuing to have problems with the Corinthians acceptance of him. Therefore, he reminded them that he was manifest to God, and he trusted that he was also manifested to their consciousness. The apostle had already commended himself to them. Hence, he would not do so again, verse 12. But he was giving them an opportunity to boast on his behalf in order that they might have a reply with reference to the ones boasting in appearance and not in practice. He was talking about the legalizers who had come in and caused disturbance in the Corinthian church. Paul was neither boasting nor seeking praise from the Corinthians. No man using this language is seeking self-praise. One seeking self-praise tells people what they want to hear. Paul's personal defense included distinction between appearance and heart. He was not talking about externals, but about the heart. The heart reveals what one is within himself. Paul had no confidence in and made no display of externals, such as schools of the prophets, associations with influential people from whom he could get letters of recommendation, etc. 
he was not concerned about man's recommendation. He had his letter of recommendation from God, the truth that had been committed to him. His life was his recommendation to the people. Paul's enemies were legalizers who boasted in appearance. They boasted that they could get letters of recommendation from the Sanhedrin. They recognized Christ only as the seed of David, Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. But they neither saw nor laid hold of Christ's resurrection, which put him in a higher relationship than David with the eternal covenant of God's grace. They did not see him as the one who, by the power of the Holy Spirit, had been raised out from among the dead. They rejected that, and they even crucified this one whom they acknowledged as the seed of David. They did not know that Jesus Christ had become a minister of the circumstances on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises to the fathers. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus Christ was not only the minister of reconciliation, but he is also the reconciler. Paul's godly zeal was being misrepresented by his enemies. Where there is godly fear, there is automatically a godly zeal for the things of God. The Lord Jesus manifested zeal for the place of worship when he drove the money changers from the temple. John chapter 2 verse 17 and Psalms chapter 69 verse 9. The zeal of God's house consumed him. He physically chased them out of God's house. Some abuses in the local church today may be reformed by appeal to the people, but sometimes they are abuses that cannot be brought into a right position before God by appeal. Then, drastic means must be used. Other abuses can be changed only by a righteous soul acting by divine authority. Paul manifested zeal before Festus, and Festus accused him of being out of his mind. Acts chapter 26, verse 24. Paul's enemies in Corinth misrepresented his zeal and accused him of being out of his mind. But he told the Corinthians that whether he was beside himself, it was to God, and whether he was sober, it was for their cause. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. Paul did not act from appearance, but from the heart. The love of Christ controlled him. Verses 14 and 15. These two verses, which are very controversial, must be studied together. Most people believe that this teaches universal redemption. Christ died for everybody. Paul purposed to show in verses 14 and 15 how the elect are constrained to live for Christ and not for themselves. 1. If the term, quote, then we're all dead, close quote, refers to being dead in sin, how can those who are dead in sin live for Christ? What kind of reasoning would say that Christ died for all who were dead in sins? Those who live would live for themselves. 2. Recipients of grace feel the constraining influences of Christ dying for them. This constrains them to die to sin and to live for Christ. The message of reconciliation has been committed to God's people. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Power is not in the message itself. Power is in the message only as it is brought to the heart of an individual by the Holy Spirit. Messengers are entrusted servants of Christ, and we are willing to endure all things for the elect's sake, that the elect might experience subjective reconciliation when a work of grace has been wrought in their hearts. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. The all things of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 includes 1. Imparting, 2. Outworking, and 3. Completing of objective reconciliation. Every Christian has been entrusted with God's message, and he is a representative on behalf of Jesus Christ. God appeals through us. Therefore, when one gives the truth of God, God is appealing through the truth given. The command to be reconciled to God is addressed to those who have been objectively reconciled. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. A person has no part in objective reconciliation, but he does have a part in understanding subjective reconciliation. Reconciliation comes as an act of understanding. By a person's act of faith, he apprehends the message and accepts it. 
but there is a continual reconciling work going on. Every time a Christian sins, his fellowship with God is broken. He has offended God, hence he must be reconciled. Conclusively, this ministry of reconciliation continues throughout our lives on the earth. Servants are called for the purpose of effecting experiential reconciliation in the lives of those who have been regenerated. The command to be reconciled is an areas passive imperative of the Greek word katalasa. There is a difference between the passive voice in reference to one being born of God and the passive voice as it is used of one who has been commanded by another. To whom the ministry of reconciliation has been given, to be reconciled to God. There are three kinds of passive voice. One is called the direct agent. The second is the intermediate agent. And the third is the impersonal agent. The person God regenerates was dead in trespasses and sins. He was passive to spiritual things. Therefore, God acted upon him. But the person who begs the regenerate to be reconciled to God is the intermediate agent. He speaks in behalf of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he tells the one who has already been quickened by God to be reconciled. He gives the truth that the regenerated person may know what he is in Jesus Christ. The Word of God is the impersonal agent. Two focal points in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 are 1. The incarnation explains Christ's sinlessness. And 2. The crucifixion was on behalf of all the elect. Jesus Christ paid for all the sins of all the elect of all time. Hence, his death was also retroactive to include the Old Testament saints. God was in Christ doing the legal work at Calvary. The Holy Spirit applies what Jesus Christ accomplished, and he is in the elect doing the practical work. How wonderful and awesome that God has committed the ministry of reconciliation to those to whom he has imputed and imparted his righteousness. Working together, those who have been made righteous in Christ's righteousness appeal to the regenerate not to receive the grace of God in vain, but to be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. The only person who will hear are those in whom God has done a work of grace. There was no life in the bones to which Ezekiel preached. Ezekiel chapter 37. Preaching may organize, but it is not and cannot give life. After the bones were organized, brought together, and flesh came upon them, they were still minus life. But Ezekiel continued preaching to them. Preaching may reform, but it cannot regenerate. A multitude may come together in a football stadium. A preacher may preach to them, but that is only indicative of organizational effort. Preaching may create excitement, but that is not proof of life. There may be noise and shaking without power. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 7. Large gatherings do not necessarily prove the presence of the Holy Spirit. Multitudes come together, but there is no breath or power in them separate from the Spirit and regeneration. This concludes Side A of Tape 